My name is Michael Anstis, um, and this is Mauricio Salentino. We're going to present to you Uberfy today. Um, we're both developers from Red Hat who work and contribute towards this project. So this is what we're going to run through very quickly. Uh, what it is, why we did it, who we are, where you can find us, and uh, then how to use it. And um, then there's a load of demos, which Mauricio is going to do for me, and then it's the Q&A. So Uberfire is um, a rich client's platform which provides all the services and features you will need to write a workbench type application um, or a web-based IDE type of application. Um, we don't provide any widgets. We're not a widget library. Um, we leave that entirely up to your own choosing. We're not interested ourselves with um, implementing data binding in any widgets because, again, we're not a widget library. That's entirely down to any other libraries you choose to use, or however you may want to implement it yourselves. Um, obviously, we use um, GWT, uh, mainly for the cross-browser um, cross um, compilation. Um, and Araya, we heavily rely upon Araya. And there's a talk after this in room two about Araya. So if you're interested in some of the things I mentioned here, it's worth going to see the Araya talk as well. Um, Araya uses, uh, it provides for us um, client-side CDI, so that's full um, CDI in the browser where you can inject resources, observe events, and things like that. Um, templated views where you, you can construct your views um, declaratively rather than pr programmatically, um, similar to, I guess, UI binder, and a message bus, which is cross-server um, client and um, cross-client. But I'll leave uh, that up to the UI talk, really. Um, so, yeah, this is... a uh, really what we are. Uh, the workbench is the client side of it, where we um, provide you know, the, the UI elements. But it also provides a full pluggable virtual file system. Um, out of the box, we have two virtual file systems. And I'll go into those more later. Uh, we also provide a metadata engine for indexing and querying any assets that you index in the workbench itself, which is useful for um, you know, if you're doing an IDE type application and you want to support uh, refactoring, then, then that can be useful. Security, we provide uh, authentication and authorization of users, uh, which kind of uh, is a pluggable mechanism, and obviously you can um, plug in the container providers for those services. So we provide a consistent API on the client and the server for you to use. Um, then extensions, I'll go more into when we look at what the Uberfire ecosystem is, and the same for integration. Okay, this is um, effectively our technology stack that we use for, for Uberfire. Um, down the bottom, we have a clustered uh, virtual file system and a metadata engine and user preferences store with security. And on top of that, we heavily use GWT and URI. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the CDI bus um, and the UI templates. We don't impose MVP. Again, we don't, it's not our business to really dictate how and where you write your, your screens and editors. That's down to you. But we support MVP in the framework, but we also support any kind of... Uh, widgets you want to write yourself, really, as long as it extends these widgets. This is the Uberfire ecosystem. Um, the red bit there is what Uberfire core is, and that's quite a lightweight um, framework which provides these services and features I've mentioned before. Um, but on top of that, we, we've built out a lot of extensions. Um, uh, notably would be the governor one, which uh, provides um, branch management um, if you're using the Git-based backend of VFS. Um, promotion between branches and um, a build system and an incremental build. So depending on what type of project you may be authoring in your web-based IDE, then you get full out-of-the-box support for um, pluggable builders, pluggable incremental building as well, and reporting back to the UI. Uh, Uberfire extensions is where we store um, things that we found useful in our use of Uberfire. Um, Uberfire we use internally at Red Hat for a product called, or a community project called Draws. Uh, which is the rules management system, and the JBPM, BPM system, which is a business process system. So we use Uberfire for all the web tooling for those. And Uberfire extensions, uh, as 
really where we keep a lot of the shared kind of, uh, things we found useful there, which I, I cover very briefly later as well. Um, Full Modeler and Dash Builder are two almost standalone applications, but they provide um, things which we use in relationship to JBPM, which is uh, building forms for um, human tasks and processes. And Dash Builder is a metrics and management information, I guess, application where you can configure different screens to show different graphs and metrics from different data sources. Who we are? Well, as I mentioned, we're from uh, JBoss Red Hat, really. Um, the primary developers are on the Jules and JVPM team. Uh, we work closely with the URI team, hence I keep sort of plugging them. Um, why we did it, we had a, a huge monolithic um, GWT web application, which was proving incredibly difficult to extend and um, add new features to. Um, so we decided to start from scratch and write a much more uh, flexible system where we could very easily add new screens and features and very easily share a lot of the common infrastructure that we found ourselves um, needing in the old application. So out of that came um, the need to integrate different um, technologies where previously we had had kind of, a, I guess, screens or part of our tooling implemented in, in different technologies. We wanted to integrate them better and provide interoperability between them. Um, but one of the main driving factors was we had a, a huge amount of legacy widgets and screens which we didn't want to rewrite, but we wanted to be able to reuse them much more easily. Um, and that's how Uberfire came about with its pluggable composition. Where we are, there's a website, um, and we're on Git, IRC, and Google Groups. Um, I won't go mention it anymore, but obviously, if you look at the video later and pause it, you can grab the details there. Uh, so, okay, so how do you use it? Uh, the workbench itself is um, heavily an annotation driven development environment. So, anything you want to write, whether it's a perspective, which is similar to the Eclipse type perspective, or a screen, or an editor. Um, you can annotate your existing widgets with um, some annotations to expose it to the workbench, and then they will just be available out of the box. On top of that, we have uh, layout managers. Um, so within perspective, you can have your screens uh, either defined statically, so you might have a dashboard style thing where you have a set layout of, um, of widgets, or you might want to more expose your users to more of kind of a free format, drag and drop type environment. So we have different layout managers for, for that. Perspectives I keep mentioning, so I won't say it again. Screens, we differentiate from an editor as a screen need not be tied to a persistent file, uh, persisted on the virtual file system. Um, it could just be, uh, I don't know, like a message console possibly, which just has been recording uh, messages in memory and just displays them to the user. An editor would be more akin to editing a file in, in Eclipse or an IDE. And all of these um, perspective screens and editors can subscribe to lifecycle methods from the workbench to be notified of their startup destruction when they receive the focus and lose focus. Um, Uberfire is kind of the way the, the different kind of screens and stuff navigate between each other is effectively based on um, GWT's activities and places. So at the heart of Uberfire, we have a place manager where um, because of the client side CDI, you can inject an instance of that anywhere you like client side, and then you can go to um, any uh, defined screen editor perspective or, or pop-up. Okay, composition. This is uh, how effectively you would create a deployment unit for an Uberfire based application. There's very, very little code in the web application itself. It uh, has a couple of classes which we've used to bootstrap the VFS kind of uh, that you want, because there's different virtual file system implementations, some of them have to be configured differently. Uh, also, the, the metadata engine, you can uh, configure that in, in the startup stuff. But it's literally in, in the JBoss, Jules, and JBPM web tooling, our startup, our actual web application code is probably about 10 classes, if that. And then the rest of it is through composition with the um, build system, where we just in include different jars. Uberfire is Maven-based. It's probably worth mentioning that. So um, we would just add extra imports or extra dependencies in the, in the WARS um, POM file, and they would then become available to the web application. The workbench is um, uh, hierarchical. So we start with the workbench. And then inside that, we can have one-to-n perspectives, each of which can contain one-to-n panels. And each one of those panels can contain a part. And a part would be a screen or an editor. Um, different panel managers may represent those parts differently. Some may be a tab panel, for example, and each part would be a tab, or we have a drop-down 
or a, sorry, a stack panel uh, where you only see one part at a time and you have a drop down to select different um, files that are open. Here's an example. This is a screenshot from uh, the, the uh, application I keep mentioning. Uh, so that's the, that's the workbench, which is the whole thing. Um, then that would be a perspective, a logical grouping of um, related panels. So we'd have the file explorer, uh, or the project explorer, then we've got a decision table editor and the messages panel. So that, they're logically grouped into a perspective. Uh, that's a panel. Uh, hierarchical menus, um, because we have this notion of workbench perspectives and screens, we also support the uh, definition of menus and uh, toolbars at the three different levels of workbench perspective and part. So the same screenshot, there's a workbench menu, that's a perspective menu, and then you have a, a part menu. Okay. So these are the four primary uh, components that you can uh, plug into the framework, a perspective, workbench screen, workbench editor, and workbench pop-up. Um, hopefully self-explanatory, so I won't linger on them. Um, to get those exposed to the workbench, you'd annotate your class with the, one of the foregoing annotations, and then depending on what that class extends, you may need to provide um, one or more of these other annotated methods. So part title would give a, a title on the, in the workbench of that, of that screen you've got open. Part title decoration is if you want to uh, decorate it with a, with a widget, so you've got a, you know, an icon next to your text. Uh, the part view is, is, is probably the most important one there, and that is uh, mandatory. Um, what that allows is you to, if you're using the MVP and you choose to annotate your presenter with uh, the, the workbench screen annotation, then you need to tell the uh, tell Uberfire where it can actually get a view to actually show in the panel. So the part view method would return an is widget. Um, if your class extends um, you know, is widgets, so you're not using MVP and you've just got a one fat class, then you don't need to annotate anything with part view. Menu bar and toolbar just uh, basically tell Uberfire where it can get uh, your web menu and toolbar definitions. These are the life cycles that we expose. So again, these are all optional. Um, there's default, uh, no operation implementations, but you annotate any uh, method of, on startup, close, focus, loss of focus, and may close. Um, and then Uberfire will call, call into those, those hook points um, at the appropriate time. This is an example of a perspective class. As you can see, it's annotated with workbench perspective, and we have an identifier for it. And in this case, we also say it's the default. So when the workbench first starts up, it will show this perspective automatically. The perspective definition itself is returned by the perspective annotated method, and it just returns um, a, an object which con contains a nesting of different panels and parts to construct that perspective. We can do it programmatically there, but Uberfire also supports um, declarative perspective definitions where you could use uh, JSON to define your perspective. Here's a screen. Uh, this extends simple panel, so all we need to do is annotate it with workbench screen and an identifier, and then the title to show. Uh, we don't need the view because it extends his widget. Here's an editor, uh, much the same really, all quite um, consistent stuff. Uh, have an identifier for it uh, and supported file types. Um, which is different to the screens. This, is, this allows the workbench to automatically launch the correct editor for, um, for different files that you've got in the virtual file system. In this case, we don't extend in these widgets uh, class, so we have to provide an annotated workbench part view uh, method to get the view for that screen. This is uh, an example of the lifecycle kind of uh, usage. So in this case, we've injected the view into the presenter uh, and then the on startup method will be called by Uberfire when that, uh, that screen is first, first requested, first opened, and it receives a path into the virtual file system. And I've got an example there just showing that we set the content on the view after loading the content with, from the path. And that's the type of thing you could do. Nobody's forcing anybody to use VFS to retrieve and store your assets. Um, we use it extensively, and it's, it's there. Um, I'll talk more about it in a couple of slides' time. But if you choose to, you know, you've got a servlet which can you know, serve up your content for your screens, then, then use a servlet. Nobody's, nobody's forcing you to use anything in Uberfire. It's meant to just provide the scaffolding and framework for you to, to use your existing screens and editors as a way you best see fit. So this is the place manager that I mentioned back on slide two or something. Um, all of those screens and editors had a, and perspectives had an identifier. 
And here we could use the place manager to go to the identifier, and that would just instruct the workbench to load that screen in, in, the, in one of the panels. Um, you can also request a place, which is just a, a, a class which allows you to provide some extra parameters to the request to go to a screen. So place request would, would notionally include you know, any custom parameters you want to pass in that aren't available on the path. Um, you can also go to path directly, but obviously that's just a convenience method. And then you can close places as well programmatically. Here's a brief example of how it works. Uh, just builds a menu, um, go somewhere, and it responds with a command. And then we just use place manager, go to, and then an identifier for that screen. So that would launch that screen. Virtual file system. So, so that's enough of the, the UI side of stuff, really. The virtual file system, we backported to Java 1.6. Um, because a lot of our customers are still on 1.6, the NIO2 API. And we expose that consistently on the client side, in browser, and, and on the server side. So no matter where you're, you, know, you want to access the file system, you can use the same API to do so. Um, the way you invoke it is different on the clients, although the API is the same, because it uh, will be an asynchronous call. So you need to handle a callback for the, um, for the content. We have different pluggable implementations. Uh, out of the box, we have a Git-based one and a simple file system one. Um, everybody is free to obviously implement your own one. Um, we had plans to do some more, but uh, um, like I said, our priorities changed, and we're sticking with the two we have at the moment. Um, concurrency support is out of the box for um, how to best term that. Um, Client-side optimistic lock-in, really. So, um, we have all the plumbing in place to support that for your editors, so you don't have to worry about um, implementing your own client-side optimistic lock. Uh, we also, or the virtual file system, uh, the, the Git-based one at least, is uh, cluster-enabled, which we use Zookeeper and Helix to cluster that around. Uh, the metadata engine, we back that with Lucene on the server side, um, but it's entirely pluggable as to what indexes you want to write. Uh, again, in our, our usage of Uberfire up in the, the Jules kind of project, we have a bunch of indexes for Java files, rule files, business processes, and all sorts of things. But we index those and, and, and with um, the API available in, in, in Uberfire. And we have a bunch of uh, queries which are pluggable where you can you know, query that metadata however you want to. So the service is there. You can either use it optionally or you don't have to. Uh, the choice is yours. Security, again, another pluggable part of the workbench. Most bits in the workbench are pluggable to a greater or lesser extent. Um, again, we have the same API on the client and the server, so you don't have to worry really where your code is going to run as to how um, you can access the ser security services. Um, it, offers, it supports authorization and uh, authentication. Uh, and uh, you can use it declaratively with uh, some annotations or programmatically. So an example of using it. Declaratively, is you can annotate any kind of resource within the uh, within your code base um, with with the at, at roles annotation, and then Uberfy would know to protect that that resource with uh, the, the roles you have there. We have some other annotations related to security, where you can say these roles either all have to be present, or one of them present, or or they have to be not in one of those roles. Um, so that's the simplest form of it, really. And things like menu items, toolbar items, screens perspectives, they can all be protected out of the box with roles. Um, if you're writing your own classes, for instance, you've got a, you know, a button that you want to protect people from pressing, then you can implement the runtime resource interface, and uh, you can specify their collection of the roles that that button needs to have, and you can then programmatically get Uberfire to restrict access to various kind of things within the workbench. OK, so that's the core Uberfire, really, and it's a very uh, small library, really. Um, but we do have a bunch of plugins and extensions, some of which uh, relate more to the topic of this talk, I guess, which is the, the cloud uh, IDE-based stuff. So plugins, uh, one of the major plugins we have been working on in 2014 is the support for dynamic um, screens, uh, the authoring of dy screens dynamically in the workbench. So we, we authored some, effectively, plugins ourselves, um, which give the user the ability to write um, either perspectives, menus, uh, screens, or editors um, within the workbench itself and um, using any JavaScript language that they, they choose. I should probably point out that if you want to use GWT for your plugins at present, they need to be compiled in at you know, um, GWT compilation time. We don't support dynamic runtime plugins or, or the GWT ones. Uh, so this is a perspective editor where you can drag and drop kind of different bits into the screen to create a perspective. 
Uh, this is a declarative uh, perspective editor. And down the bottom there, there's a little blue drop down which says main. Um, that allows you to paste in some code for one of the Uberfire, Uberfire lifecycle methods. So you can get your, your perspective to run some code when, it's, when, it's, uh, when it starts. This is the uh, plugins for the screens. It's a bit like JS Fiddle. So the top left allows you to put in a, you know, a HTML template for your screen or um, any other template you choose to use if you're using a different uh, you know, JavaScript library. Top right-hand corner, you can add in some CSS. Bottom right, you can upload you know, icons and stuff or images you want to show in your screen. And then the bottom little, the, the kind of center kind of section there where the drop-down's shown is probably the main part of it, where you can, you can paste in or type in your, your JavaScript or your Angular um, to write a screen um, and then link it up to any of the Uberfire lifecycle methods and uh, give it a title. That's the menu editor, so nothing particularly glorious, but it allows you to define menus dynamically at one time. Uh, apps is something we're kind of venturing into. Because we have these uh, persistent formats of plug-in um, plug screens and menus and perspectives, we thought, well, why not go one stage further and bundle it into uh, a, a persistent uh, configuration of a whole application? So we're, we're kind of just starting on work now to provide um, Uberfire applications, which is an extension to the core Uberfire. So uh, you know, it's, there's a, it's a take it or leave it type of thing. You don't need to use it. It's not part of the, the, the minimal framework. This is uh, an example extension that we've written. It's uh, called Wires, and it uses a great uh, library called Lienzo, which is a uh, kind of a wrapper around HTML5 Canvas. And we're kind of uh, venturing on a, uh, I guess, Visio or OmniGraphle kind of equivalent app there. Uh, Properties Editor is something we're using quite consistently at the moment for just, you know, any properties you choose to de uh, declare to the, to the editor. Um, and social activities is a set of functionality where it will record a timeline for different users, and you can follow different users, subscribe to their activities. Um, and um, it uh, has various adapters for events that we fire out of the Workbench code. And obviously, anything anybody chooses to add themselves to the Workbench code for their own um, IDE or Workbench, it can, you can have adapters for the social integration to record events of interest there as well. There's another screenshot of uh, the social activity stuff. This is the Dash Builder that we've got, which is, um, I sort of mentioned earlier, it's a data visualization tool where the components of the, of the dashboard can be drag and dropped and placed around programmatically using the, um, sorry, not programmatically, dynamically using the uh, perspective editor that I showed. Uh, we also support integration with Angular. Uh, we don't do it the same way as Singular, uh, uh, was, was obviously earlier this week has been talking about. We, we support uh, integration with uh, native Angular, either embedding Uberfire applications or app Uberfire, Uberfire places, so that would be a perspective editor or screen in, a, in an Angular application. We have an Angular directive where you can embed Uberfire um, screens into an Angular app, or likewise with the dynamic plugin editor I showed earlier, there's, there's a, well, you can uh, you know, use Angular to, to define a plugin screen and save it. Um, we're not limited to Angular, really, we don't care. We just uh, inject the JavaScript library into the host page for your GWT application, and then the, the plugin JavaScripts are, are downloaded and, and executed. So. We're, uh, we don't really fast which, which JavaScript technology you want to use to write plugins. It's a quick example here. Um, Some way down the screen near the bottom, the final script tag is the Uberfire components JavaScript. So that's, that's all you'd need to add to your um, Angular application to get um, Uberfire client side stuff running. Um, obviously, you'd have to include the JavaScript um, from GWT there as well. Um, so that's an example uh, Anglia application where we've got an Uberfire component there showing a welcome widget. Um, that's the welcome widget itself. Uh, so it's got the identifier welcome, and all it shows is a text box. Um, and as you can see there, we've got a Uberfire component. The UF component is welcome, which, which relates to the identifier we had on the screen. Um, and that's the UI binder for the, for the widget. And that's what your end result would be. And that would be an Angular application with a Uberfire widget in it. OK, cloud provisioning. This is something we've been working on in the last three months. And it's pretty much as close to the cutting edge in Uberfire as we've got. Um, what it supports is um, 
discovery of, um, well, firstly, let's, let's go back one step. Um, Uberfire web applications themselves are, um, let's say, for lack of a better term, cloud enabled out of the box. Um, we deploy them to um, Red Hat's OpenShift um, cloud solution quite frequently and run them from there. There's, um, and, and that's just with one of the default cartridges that you get from, from uh, Red Hat. There, are, um, there is another cartridge for OpenShift which supports um, the BROS or the product versions of the Jules and JBPM workbenches. Um, and that cartridge is, is pretty much the same as the, the, the one that's free and you know, easily available, except it supports the clustering of the VFS better. Because in the cloud, a lot of the ports are normally shut down, and we need those open for the clustering. So um, it's just a little bit different. Um, and that works by, so that's, the, that's effectively out of the box, what you get for free um, cloud enablement. Um, in fact, we do also support um, deployment to, um, I guess, uh, on-demand um, container services such as Fabricate, where Uberfire has, has some plugins to discover any, any Fabricate instance running via uh, Jocular, um, and then deploy instances of um, web applications you build within Uberfire, and that's what we're going to demo in a moment, will be um, build, you, we have a, um, in, if I go in the ecosystem, I won't go back to it, too many slides back, but uh, in the ecosystem where I mentioned there's governor where we have the build system and incremental build system. So what we've written is um, using, using Uberfire and the, the extensions in governor is uh, a mini web IDE where you can build um, the, the spring pet store example and edit it. Then you can generate a war file and we deploy that to fabricate um, from within the, 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 um, the web app. Um, so that pretty much is uh, the slides part of it. I don't know how we're doing for time, but uh, I want to hand over to Mauricio now, who's going to actually show some more exciting demos than the slides. So thank you. Hi. OK, guys. So thank you very much for staying here with us until late. Uh, what I will try to show in the demo section now is uh, how you can get started with UFR. And uh, as you can see, there are like a lot of extensions, a lot of components. But the first thing that I would like to show you is how to get started with the most basic workbench that you can create. Because that's our main objective, uh, for you to just get the basics and then start adding up exactly what you need instead of getting like a huge tool that you cannot get rid of the parts that you don't want. So first of all, you can go to the web page. And inside the web page, we have the documentation section. And inside the documentation section, we have this five minutes introduction which basically shows you, shows you how to use a Maven archetype to create the most basic workbench that you can create. And I will do that here so you can see how quickly you can get something up and running. So what I'm running is that line that basically creates an archetype and it goes into the interactive mode where you need to choose the group ID for the artifact, the artifact ID, and uh, the package, right? So the version is fixed there. Um, so what I'm doing here, I'm just creating a workbench template, and this creates an empty workbench, so with the minimum set of features that you can get from, from Uberfire. So I've just created that project. Let me show you a little bit the structure of this project. Here you have the project that was created, and there are two really important things inside. So we have here, this is the directory, which is called Showcase, which is something that we uh, called distribution in some, sometimes, because this is basically the web application that it's mixing all the components together and allowing you to, to browse them and, and use them. Uh, then what we have here is a component, which is composed by the client side, the backend side, and an API between those two. And this is the one that Michael was mentioning, that it's a jar containing a set of screens or a specific functionality. So if you're interested to build your own editors or your own screens, we suggest you to create components for those screens and try to package them according to their functionality. So what I will do now is I will compile this archetype. Yep. I will compile all the projects. Sorry. That's it. And uh, I will run the, the, the workbench to see what it's in there. And uh, we will be, we will be expect, expect, inspecting a little bit uh, the perspectives, the panels, the screens, and all the things that are being uh, delivered by this very simple workbench. So remember, we have the showcase. And inside the showcase, we have the web app. And I will run this in hosted mode in 
the, the mode. Where is that? Yep. Ah, uh, sorry. Okay. So I'm running this application, and as soon as it gets started, we will see that there are a couple of screens. There is one perspective defined, and uh, while this is starting, what we can do is we can open this project inside the ID here. Let's take a look at that. So I, what I will do is I will open the component that was created by the archetype, and we can take a look at the source code. So what I created in here is this component presenter and the component view. The component presenter is a new screen. As Michael mentioned, it, has, it needs to have an, an identifier so we can call on that. And uh, then basically what we have is an, an asynchronous interaction with the server side here. Uh, this is using your eye. So I'm injecting this service, that it's a backend service somewhere, and I can just call this by using these callbacks, which is basically saying hi, it's not doing that much. And then when we get the callback, we will just basically set the value into the screen. Let me run the application here, right, so be patient with me and uh, let's hope that the demo gods be gentle at this point. If everything worked correctly, we will be able to see the application. It takes some time, it's the first time, but yeah, it should be there. Uh, so again, uh, this is the most basic thing that you can get from Uberfire and on top of this, you can start adding dependencies from all the other modules that we provide and or just start creating your own modules as, as you wish. So again, we have the top menu here. This is the workbench menu and it's designed to contain the most like top level menus entries in, in your whole application. Then here we have a, a new perspective, which is this perspective containing two screens. Here we have the, the, stack, the stack list that Mike also mentioned. And we can see that the greeting screen, it's not defined in our, inside of our component, but it's provided by the UFR framework, so you can remove that if you want. And uh, this one is the one that it was created inside this example component. This is just the label and just calling the server side and getting back the, the highest string. But what other interesting things do you get here? So basically you get these drag and drop options where you can define the layout of the application dynamically. And this is uh, per user, which means that we provide a service that allows you to store in the user preferences for the currently logged in user how this perspective looks like. Uh, so the next time that the user logs in, it remembers that and it opens this screen in this, in this state, right? Uh, you also have here like full screen for the panels and yeah, that kind of stuff. And you can also close the panels, right? Uh, so this is the most basic thing that you can get with your fire. And you can start creating your own screen quite easily, just creating two classes or maybe even just one, which just has this workbench screen annotation on it. So let me just quickly jump to the next demo that I have. The next thing that I would like to show you are the runtime, pl the runtime plugins that Michael mentioned, which is basically a feature that you can include as a dependency to the most basic URFI workbench, and that's exactly what we did here. We just created a new application with the archetype. We defined some uh, uh, dependencies from the components that provide these like, rapid application development uh, features. And using that, uh, you will be able to create, the, this is the security kicking in, so let me log in. Uh, you will be able to create screens dynamically here in, in the browser. Uh, you will be able to create perspectives as well using the, perspe the perspective manager. And you will be able also to create dynamic menus. Uh, everything without like restarting the application or anything. So you will just define that. Everything will be stored in the VFS, in the virtual file system. So it will be there for the next time that you run the application, of course. So let's take a look at the application. And now we have a new perspective here, a new menu entry as well, that takes us to this plugin perspective. So we will be able to create a new screen here. So I will take this opportunity to show the Angular JS integration, which the most basic Angular demo that is published there in the internet. Uh, but this is not, uh, of course, because we are in a WIDA application, this is not something that I personally would recommend to do, but it's something that you can do and it helps us to demonstrate that you can basically put inside the screen whatever you want. There is no restriction on the, on the content that you are going to, to render in there. So what I'm copying here is just the most basic to-do list example uh, from AngularJS. This is the controller 
and this is the template for the screen. Right, it has variables and stuff there. It, it will show like a to the list screen. And I will need to set the title in here. So, all right, and I will save this. Okay, so as soon as I hit save, basically all these files were saved to the virtual file system, which is provided by this Git uh, layer. So everything is inside the Git repository at this point. And that Git repository will be used to compile the projects and, and do all the things that we want to do with that. Imagine this as like the Eclipse uh, virtual file system layer that they have there. What I will do now, I will create a new perspective. So dynamically, I will create the perspective. This has a very basic grid layout and editor, but of course, Again, we are providing this as a demo for you to understand what kind of things can be done and the restrictions that you will have in, in, into doing things. So what I will do here, I will just throw a screen component and this allow me to put any screen that is defined inside the application. And as, 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 as far as I remember, the screen was called Angular Demo there. So what I will have in here, it will be the Angular Demo screen. And uh, yeah, I will have here HTML thing, All right? Nothing fancy. But again, you can compose these perspectives with any screen that you want, and you can also code all these screens using Wit and start creating your own perspectives on runtime here. So I will save this as well. Now my perspective is saved. And what I will do now, finally, I will just create a menu entry for accessing that perspective, because if not, we don't have any way to, to go in there. So. I will create this, and this is the demo perspective. Okay, so we are saying here that we want to go to that perspective as soon as we hit the menu entry. Um, all right, and I will save, save the menu configurations, and that's basically it. Now we should have access to that screen and to that menu entry. I've just hit refresh, so yep, there it is. So I can access to my app, and this should be showing the AngularJS screen, all right? Uh, this is just a simple to-do thing, so yeah, you can use that and it, it should work. The other thing that I've added to this demo here is this text box and uh, this button, which basically is showing uh, the integration or how we are exposing the, the Uberfire API to the JavaScript world. That means that any, Java, any screen that is using JavaScript can directly call to the place manager, which basically allows us to move from one screen to the other. In this case, what I'm going here, I'm doing is taking the name of the perspective uh, for, for this perspective that takes us this menu. So basically when I will hit this, this JavaScript will call the JavaScript API, and it will, it will call the Java API to move the screen to the other panel, right? So that's one of the things that you can do. But of course, if you're interested in building IDs, you will be more interested in writing editors probably. Uh, so I have this other demo that shows basically how an editor look like. And this is a very simple editor, again, built inside the, one of the applications created with the archetype, so just a couple of classes. And we can take a look at this application here as well. So let me see, here we have the Markdown Editor class, which is, again, it's annotated with this Workbench Editor annotation. It defines the name for that editor, and it's defining the supported types, right? So this is mostly what you wanted to do in an IDE. It's register different uh, resource types, and for this, each different resource types, you will define uh, a different editor, right? You want to edit different things. Um, so if you take a look at the resource type, this is extending this other type definition, and it's using just a simple regex or a pattern in order to identify which files will be opened by this editor, basically. And finally, what I would like to show you here is um, the menu. Uh, that it's using the virtual file system service, which it was, again, injected using Array. We have an asynchronous call to that service. And this allows us to access the files is stored inside this uh, Git repository in the backend. So what we are doing here is just um, going and reading this file, which is called readme.md. And uh, the service is resolving that file and returning a path to us, to the resource. And we are using the place manager to go to that path. Inside, the place manager will know that this is a resource, uh, and we have an associated resource type to it, and it will open the appropriate editor. So I, I will just wanted to show you how the, the editor looks like, so you understand what those classes are doing. But again, the editor was defined using 
uh, a couple of classes for defining the type, and then one just class for defining the editor, and probably a UI binder template uh, to define the, the layout of the editor, which is basically a text area where you can uh, write the content and then the, uh, an HTML panel to show the content after rendering. Uh, it should be there. So as soon as I click edit, I will go to the virtual file system, open that file, and retrieve that file, and here we have it. Right, so we have a markdown editor where we can create content and edit things. Right? And again, we can define the layout by dragging and dropping things, and you can com start composing like more advanced perspectives uh, depending on what you are planning to do. Finally, I would like to show you uh, a more advanced thing, uh, which is showing the Fabric 8 integration. Fabric 8 is basically this provisioning server. Thank you. It's uh, uh, providing this provisioning service where you can decide to deploy things, and it will automatically provide a new, provide a new container for you, a new container instance. In this case, will be Tomcat. So every time that uh, we would like to deploy an application, Fabric will take that request, and it will create a new Tomcat instance. It will start that Tomcat instance, and, and it will deploy our application inside it. So what I'm doing here, I am I'm just starting the, the server. And as soon as it's started, I can just run my, my demo, uh, which again is a, a more complex distribution of these workbenches because it contains much more dependencies. But again, not all of them, not all the ones that we have. While this is starting, I would like to mention that um, a little bit of the context of the projects where we are working on. Uh, we started uh, to work on this because we have a couple of very, very, very big projects with tons of screens. And the most important thing, it was for me that uh, there will be so many different roles and different types of people interacting with the application that we needed to make sure that we will provide different views for different people, basically. So we have technical users, we have business users, we have uh, system administrators. And each of these users uh, can interact with some similar views and doing almost the same things but we need to display things differently. And for those kind of situations, we needed to have this very flexible perspective editors, perspective editors to, the, to have this possibility of saying, okay, for this role, this resource will be opened by this editor, or for this other role, we will use a more technical view for it. So I'm logging into this one. And I guess that this is more what you will expect if you are creating your own cloud ID, uh, where we will have uh, a way to clone external Git repositories. So basically, you can go to GitHub, you have your project in there, you can use the administration uh, component that will allow you to clone that repository internally to the tool. And uh, then you will like to browse the files inside your projects and start changing things, right? So what we have here, again, we have the welcome screen. We have a, a tab in here, uh, sorry, a panel in here with a couple of tabs. We have the build panel in here that will show you the output of the build of our application. And then we can start like opening files in here, right? So this is the pom.xml file. And as soon as I click this, uh, it recognizes that this, this is the pom.xml file and I can build this project. If I had more time, I would like to show you how I can change this application and deploy that multiple times and build these things and see if the tests are, are running or not. But unfortunately, I have limited time, so I will just compile the application here. So this is Maven running in the back, and it's building this pet clinic Spring application, which is fairly common application to, to demo with. And it's quite com complete as well, because it has tests, and it's running uh, yeah, basically in a Tomcat instance. So what I'm doing here, it's Maven. I'm getting all the Maven output uh, from the build service in here, and yeah succeed here. So that means that I can just start the provisioning, which is basically calling or requesting Fabric uh, for an, a new container instance so I can deploy that. I will click this here, and uh, for some reasons, at some point, well, this uh, provisioning screen is detecting that there is a Fabric 8 node available, so it will try to provision this uh, deployment to that instance. Uh, because of the network, sometimes it doesn't work like well. That that well, uh, but it seems that there was a Tomcat instance started. We can take a look at the hot IO uh, administration view from Fadvik and take a look at what's going on in there. This is integrated uh, again. This is a, 
a way to show that you can do whatever you want in here. You can integrate with the build system. You can integrate with the provisioning system. You can integrate with any or your, of your company services and provide a view with this. And uh, what Uberfy is doing is allowing you to quickly integrate and compose all those screens together and allowing the user, again, to, to customize to what they want to view and how they want to arrange it in the screen. So uh, I did the provisioning, and uh, let me see. Yep. So what we have in here, I don't know if you can see there. Well, we have a new application deployed inside the Fabricate. And I will try to access that application, and there it is. Okay, so we have a new application in a new Tomcat instance, and we didn't do anything, basically. We just request that to Fabric, and Fabric takes care of taking the web application and deploying that inside into Tomcat. Uh, there is two-way integration, of course, that, okay, we call the Fabric service and uh, report back to the application what's going on with the nodes and all that stuff, because I can just come here and basically delete this deployment. It should do that, right? So the application is no longer available there. And again, I can just go and change source code, build the application again, and do the provisioning again, and it will do it. So that's pretty much it from the demo side. Uh, we are like open for questions if you have them. And again, one more thing that I would like to add is that everything is under the Apache license. You can feel free to use it. We are a, a very open project and we are looking for contributors. So if you are interested in the project, uh, we can also start like helping you or mentoring you to get started because we enjoy being part of like a great community. So thank you very much. <laughs>